The anti-woke crusade in gaming is just replaying history. For some weird reason, I've got this sneaking suspicion that I'm about to be called a schnazi. I don't know why. It could have something to do with the fact that the average progressive's understanding of history is the Nazis and then stuff that happened before and or after the Nazis. You know, a loosely defined period of time that probably contains something valuable, but gosh darn if they can ever think of it. Which incidentally also roughly reflects their understanding of the human condition in general, but hey, details, details. So. Why this article is a little bit interesting is that it is another indicator that the progressives are beginning to understand that they are no longer winning. In fact, not that they are merely not winning anymore, but that they might actually be losing this culture war of ours. One that they have on many occasions even refused to admit that they are currently waging. So let's have a look here. I was streaming Dragon Age, the Veil God, where someone popped into my chat to declare that the game was, in their esteemed opinion, pushing an agenda. Are you going to argue against that? They were fed up with the work stuff, which in this case meant allowing players to pick their characters, genders, and sexuality. I do not think that's quite the only woke thing in Dragon Age, the Veil God. Having suffered through a few hours of it myself, there's a bit more to it than that, just just a tiny bit. Now, the Veilguard isn't exactly some radical new experiment. Actually, no, it is very much so. Dragon Age the Veilguard is a drastic departure from Dragon Age Origins, in terms of combat, in terms of storytelling, in terms of aesthetics, in terms of style, in terms of feel, in terms of characters, in terms of character design, in terms of companions, in terms of pretty much every single way that is relevant to a video game, Dragon Age the Veilguard is a huge departure from the established formula of Dragon Age. It is laced in a series that has been around for 15 years, and ignored all 15 of them, and choices have always been the whole point. You pick who you are right down to what you say, who you trust, but who, who you fight, who you fancy for the, the lot. For as long as Dragon Age has been around, it has been a game about letting players imagine any character they want and go wild with it. That is more or less correct, to a degree. Veilguard, however, is not that. Actually, that's another point that I f didn't think of. See. In Dragon Age Veilguard, even if you are trying to be actively hostile, even if you are trying to be the sarcastic spiky asshole, the video game will simply not allow you. The worst you could ever do in Dragon Age the Veilguard is give a mildly petulant comment. Whereas in previous Bioware games, you could not only be outright rude, you could just punch people on the streets. You could punch journalists. In Mass Effect, a addition that aged like the finest wine. Uh, anywho. And that's the magic, isn't it? Talk to any fan of Dragon Age and they hear the same story. They get completely absorbed in it, you don't just play the game, you inhabit it. And when you're building this character, something as personal as their gender or who they might fall in love with feels like it should be part of the deal. For anyone who's sinking hours into becoming someone else, these little details make the whole thing feel real complete. It's not about ticking boxes or pushing an agenda, it's about giving players the tools to build a world they can actually believe in, one that's got room for everyone's imagination. Well, see, here's the interesting. We'll get to this in a little bit, the we're losing ground part, but we're going to let him set the stage for us here, because I talked about this as well previously, in that inclusion, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, has at this point gone so far that it has actually excluded the original audience, and I think the previous preamble uh, illuminates that quite well. Dragon Age the Veil God is no longer Dragon Age. It, as a 15-year-old game series, no longer serves its audience but rather a fantastical new audience, apparently, that is not going to be able to earn back the cost of producing this eight-year in-development game, and a game that has received not exactly stellar reviews on Metacritic, and some flagging ones on Steam as well, although that one has buoyed itself up reasonably well. The thing is, Dragon Age didn't end up on the chopping block because it had done anything particularly shocking to upset the frail conservative mind. This guy, again, lives in a completely different world, but we'll ignore that for now. No, Dragon Age has been slated and targeted by a group of self-proclaimed anti-woke gamers working as a part of a movement known as Gamergate. Really? <laughs> really? We're back to Gamergate, aren't we? <laughs> Wow, this, uh, this individual is not particularly clued in, I will say. For anyone lucky enough to not know, Gamergate refers to a hostile campaign that surfed in 2014. 
Mm, no, we'll skip that part because that's not what it was. Gamergate was in response to an industry-wide movement to try and get rid of gamers. In large part due to the fact that we found it somewhat objectionable that somebody fucking someone else should be allowed to create reviews of that someone else's product. At first glance, the call for the gamer's voice to remain untouched by hidden exchanges might seem harmless, even reasonable. You don't say. But soon enough, the movement revealed itself to be a false banner. Uh huh. What has cloaked as concerns of conflicts of interest was, in truth, a cry of opposition. One named squarely at certain voices, certain bodies, certain lives, women of people, color LGBT voices. Like I said, not particularly clued in, this gentleman. Blah blah blah, Gamergate racist. In 2024, Gamergate has resurfaced, reshaped as a crude weapon of conservative identity politics. You know what? I'm not even going to get into that particular rabbit hole, because frankly, if I get started on exactly who started identity politics and who actually turned this into a literal doctrine, we'll be here for a while. Its advocates, loud and insistent, speak in language of grievance, throwing out slogans, go woke, bro, go, bro, and rallying against anything that resembles diversity, equity, and inclusion. Correct, the DEI, as in the political corporate term. They mark anyone who holds a different view as an enemy. Uh, well, if by different term you mean attempting to enforce politics in gaming, then correct. In their minds, a more diverse gaming world is not progress, but a threat to what they see as personal and sacred. Our already diverse gaming world, correct. By them, they mean real gamers. Those whose perspective, whose identity, whose entire sense of self has for years been reflected back to them as the norm, the white heterosexual male. Again. Now, I talked about this in a previous video. In gaming, a tale as old as time is both non-white heterosexual males and character creators where you can pick anyone you damn well choose. This game again is less about eth eth ethics than ever before. It is about possession, about claiming a domain and rejecting those who would dare to share in it, to occupy it. That is the key difference, yes. Gamergate of today, Gamergate 2.0, which was basically a meme in essence, is no longer about gaming ethics as a specific point, because that is not the arena on which we are fighting any longer. The war has expanded far beyond that. We could argue till we turn blue in the face about the specifics of gaming ethics and would achieve absolutely nothing so long as the wider culture is still massively progressive, and so that is what we have moved to change now, and successfully so. Not because to avoid those who shared in it, because we were the ones who opened our arms and welcomed you in. If you assume for a second that you are speaking the truth here, and this should turn the gears in the brain a little bit, that gaming was entirely insular, only white heterosexual males allowed, how the hell are you here? How are you as a progressive talking about gaming. How do you have a game like Dragon Age The Veil Guard? How have you had 10 years of games like Dragon Age The Veil Guard at this point? It was because those of us who were already here opened our gates to you. An enormous goddamn mistake. One that we have been trying to rectify, as escapism, which was what gaming was, has practically disappeared in a cavalcade of political messaging, which Veilgar is chock full with, to the point where we even have articles, of course, talking explicitly about how they included that into their video game and how even now it isn't good enough because you know language is super complex and constantly evolving and the one that they put in Dragon Age of Elgard well it's not good enough anymore mm. We have entire mainstream media, media news site dedicated to covering non this nonsense. We have entire agency groups and advertisers organizations and like Sweet Baby Inc. Um, narrative guidance companies dedicated to this in gaming and entertainment. You didn't merely just bumble in here, arrive one day out of nowhere. You came with a conquering army. One that we have been attempting to return back to its own house for quite some time now. And luckily, come succeeding in doing so.
I'll admit. My run with Game Gear didn't start with Dragon Age Veilgard. This year, thanks to my progressive views, I became one of their targets. I was one of the first people tagged on a ridiculous hate list, curiously called Kotaku Detected, after the website. A list that exists for no other reason to direct harassment at everyone in it. Direct awareness, more correctly. I mean, you guys were the ones who started with the blacklist campaigns. Anyway, so we'll move on a little bit here. Let's see. Uh, <sighs> It hits me a bit like a dissonant chord in a favorite song, that as I examine and judge gamers, writers, journalists, and influencers, I cannot escape a more elemental identity that shapes my existence. I am a Jew. <laughs> and here we go. This identity, forged in the crucible of history, marked by struggle and resilience, imparts upon me a heightened consciousness of the power of words, the weight of narratives, and the silence that often follows. It grants me insight into the duplicitiveness as nature of movements that wrap themselves in the shroud of righteousness while wielding hatred as they ablade. I could interpret that in some interesting ways, considering how Israel is currently going, but oh well. And regrettably, I must confront the reality that this identity makes me a particularly conspicuous target for far-right ideologies. So reader, listen up. We're losing ground here. Nobody is coming after you because you're Jewish. Good God. This absolute paranoia around this needs to end. There is no Jewish hatred in the West today. You're going to find a hell of a lot more of it in the Middle East than over here, and certainly not in America, of all places. The shadow of Game Gate movement has become alarmingly prominent over the past years. It would be easy to chalk this up to the works of faceless operatives, those right-wing profiteers who lurk in the dark corners of social media for their own gain. Those right-wing profiteers that appear to now dominate every single source of news media. The ones that were streaming to hundreds of thousands during the election. Those dark, shadowy figures that cannot be named. Or to think that this wave of anger and destruction is simply a byproduct of our broken social platforms that feed off reactionary conservative conflict. I do love again here how there is absolutely zero introspection here. At no point does he even for an instance consider that he might have caused some of this. That the progressives might indeed be the reasons for the backlash. That their actions upon gaming and entertainment might be the cause. Rather no, it's because he's a Jew. Come on now. Jesus Christ. What do you think this is? The 1940s? But to rest here in that comfort is to miss something critical, something urgent. We're either unable or perhaps unwilling to reckon with this move and head on, and until we do, we can only expect to see it grow. You know what? I would love to see that. I would love to see you confront the movement more, as you put it, because it's going to make you look somewhat ridiculous. What strikes me in that strange specific place where both memory and warning collide is how familiar these tactics are. Their leaders adopt the pose of every tyrant. Each time test and maneuver learned from the pages of the past. They manufacture enemies, create threats, bolster their cause by rallying against targets that look different, sound different, and are different. Manufactured enemies. Manufactured enemies. Their culture aggression in the guise of greater good, crying out for ethics and fairness, but wielding these words only as weapons against women, against queer people, against any who would disrupt their narrow vision. Hold on there a moment. Just uh, for yet another second of introspection here. How about women words like, oh, we're talking about, we're creating an enemy, right? Without even really defining it. Something like, uh, I don't know, um, a, a shadowy figure that hides on social media, for example. Something ill-defined and sinister that is out there. That uses specific words like ethics and fairness as weapons to get their way. And to silence their enemies like, oh, I don't know, queer, Jewish. Woman? No, no resemblances here? This isn't ringing some sort of bell anywhere? Nowhere? Really? How have we arrived at 2024 and still we have progressives with zero sense of introspection? This is genuinely why I believe that the Democratic Party is going to double down, by the way, and grow further left wing, because there doesn't appear to be any sort of room whatsoever for a self critical thought in their minds. Blah. Brings to mind the history, history is each story of a time when oppressors rose not by their strength alone, but by, by their cunning use of fear and resentment. 
like the fear of being called racist, for example. I think of the tales I grew up with, or the movement that used righteous fury to mask something darker. The socialists in Nazi Germany, you mean. The progressives of their time. To cultivate a society that through sheer force of a repetition and fire, I mean, that does indeed represent progressivism pretty well, can be made to believe in threats that didn't exist. It feels as if I'm hearing once again the low terrible hum of history calling back to us, testing whether we will recognize its voice, and so far we are failing the test. Mm. I probably know a whole lot more about the test of that particular history than you do, but details. This is our task now, not to push these movements away as if they're something to do disgusting to touch, but to break them down piece by piece, fully aware that every moment we hesitate only gives them more room to breathe and grow. And if we don't, if we drop the ball, well, we already know the playbook. We've seen this before. How we, though? And there's the interesting part as well. The progressive is now just about ready once more to throw off the veil and stop pretending that this is about some sort of uh, protectivism. Oh, we just want gay rights, etc. You have them. You've had them for a while now. We just want the same rights. You have more rights. Instead, we are coming down to we must break it down piece by piece. And why must we do that? Well, because it's a dark, shadowy organization that you should be afraid of. You know, every single thing you already mentioned. I feel like I'm reading something from a toddler from 2016, I swear to Jesus. And here we find ourselves at Kotaku Detected, a website that fancies itself a watchtower for perceived enemies. Assembling a list of names? Perceive. My dude. My dude. But to break them down piece by piece. Perceived. You have declared yourself this movement's enemy. You have declared yourself this movement's enemy to the point where you are going to break it down, where you are going to try and rally people to break it down, yet you do not believe that it has any enemies that are legitimate. All the name of holding countable those claims have tainted the gaming world with their agendas. It is a tally of journalists, editors, and developers, each name dragged through the mud not for actual fraud or errors, but for simply having a different opinion. A bad and corrosive one. You know, kind of like the Nazis. Uh, uh, simply different opinion. Different idea of what gaming could and should look like. And let's be honest, this tactic is new. Germany. I've been reading When Books Went to War by Molly Guptil Manning, I'm read that one, where she details the work of Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels. Aha, I see. You've taken some lessons to heart, I imagine. <sighs> Nazis, 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 Nazis. Could I have detected to resurrect this very tactic, dignitized and crude? Instead of a bonfire, we're now dealing with social media outrage and a race for YouTube views, making individuals the target instead of ideas, cranking up hostility rather than offering a real critique. That is literally all we do. That is literally the entire definition of our channels. Now, he's leading this towards a point down here. Now, this is actually something that I do, to a degree, agree with. Um, again, reader, we need to douse this fire before it spreads. There's an irony here, one we would do well to see clearly. The folks who shout the loudest about freedom of speech are often the same ones who can't stand the existence of certain games or the gamers who play them. Because you were the ones who started this to begin with. The reason why we have observably less freedom of speech today than we had in 1990s or 2000s is not because of the gamers. They love to proclaim their rejection of identity politics. It is funny how their blogs and YouTube channels, which they insist are all about gaming, spend way more time defending their version of acceptable identities than actually discussing the games themselves. Not about acceptable identities, it is about unacceptable politics. And hey, you know what? I, I do agree here, there is a point. There is a point of certain channels that simply produce the same content over and over again, without a whole lot of additional information added or thought given to it. Hell, I'm guilty of it on some occasions as well, though I try to bring it to a wider context again, and to find things that are a bit more interesting. Take the guy who claim, complained about the agenda in Dragon Age of Elgar. He's not upset that politics are creeping into gaming, he's furious that politics aren't the ones he's agree with. And how do you know this? It's always someone else pushing agenda, or someone else running the purity, ruining the purity of their beloved hobby. But my... 
See, this is kind of what I wanted to do about these articles, because it is just one long period of absolute lack of understanding, of absolutely zero introspection. You are playing a game with progressive politics, and yet you do not believe that the guy complaining about progressive politics in the game, defined by wokeism, is complaining about the politics. My dude, my brother. Holy shit. Nobody is asking for right-wing politics. Not a single one. We are asking for less left-wing politics. And if we must therefore demand the tyranny of neutrality be enforced by the right, then well, so the heck be it. Let's be real. Identity is all they talk about. Hammering away at it like they're defending some last bastion of truth. Come on. You... You... Um. Never mind, we're not going to go away. They want to think they're fighting against bias and their politicization of their spaces. But the reality is that, that every move is just as political. Resisting one's enemy is every bad as the enemy themselves. Mm. Part of carefully crafted campaigns that deny and diminish anyone they can't stand. So are these people hypocrites? That is a very good question, sir. Are people who would do this hypocrites? It's an interesting question. What is the answer? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't want to call you out so so obviously, but I appreciate the honesty. There's the catch. Calling them out and sharing that truth in gleeful posts can be a mistake. A trap, even. In our rush to show off how virtuous we are, we end up playing right into their hands. The reality is that these individuals are deceivers, and engaging with them on their terms only distract us from what they really want. Hmm. Their goal, as the loudest voice in this crowd they keep reminding us, isn't about having an honest chat about games or gaming culture. We tried that. By God did we try that. Didn't really work out very well. No, they thrive on chaos they create, twisting their cons conversation until even the most harmless topics become fodder for outrage. When they conjure wild claims about diversity, equity, and inclusion, these things that that just don't exist. These things that are just fantasy things that we have we have no indication of, that there appears to be no reality to. Yeah. DI, whatever the latest buzzword is, they do not seek to elevate discourse, they seek to provoke. They want you to read something ridiculous about a video game and immediately jump to the conclusion that it's all about wokeness. That's the trick we need to watch out for. Engaging with their nonsense isn't just a mistake, it's handing them the keys to the narrative. And there's the crucial one. Now, they've understood here, and there's a bit more, but it's mostly just waffling around, honestly, until we get to this part here. The narrative, that is the key part, indeed. The left has lost control of the narrative because it has lost control of the platforms. Up until this point, every single platform on the internet, be it Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, were all left-wing to the extreme, to the point where they were even willing to censor, as we saw with the laptop scandal, for example, in favor of left-wing political candidates. They were willing to remove their opposition candidates, like Trump during the January 6th nonsense, from their platforms. It was not until Elon Musk bought Twitter that there appeared to be an equal and opposite platform that cannot even be truly described as a right wing. It can simply be described as, again, the tyranny of neutrality. If you break their terms of service now, you are banned whether you be right or left. And the thing is, us right wingers, quote unquote, we've spent a lot more time reading those TOSs because we've been the primary victims. We know what we can and cannot do and say on these platforms. The left, who has had no such restrictions, don't have quite the veterancy of us. It's a prime example of how criticism can be cloaked in a veneer of respectability. The assault critics will insist they're not against the inclusion of diverse identities, but are merely pointing out flaws in the writing. It's almost laughable. Much like the attacks I've faced where they claim to criticize my opinion, the truth is that they're really just lashing out at something for representing what they despise. See, I do not even need to criticize much. You do a fantastic job of criticizing your own position. That's the issue. You are laying out my argument for me. The shadowy evil conspiracy that uses words as targets, creating fear against urban people in an attempt to rile up the masses to pick apart and destroy the opposition. 
My dude, what is your entire scree if not that? Prior to release, these culture wars had been churning out hate content for months, practically foaming at the mouth with a mere whiff of anything resembling wokeness in the game. Suddenly, they are the knights of literal integrity, waving their swords for storytelling ex excellence. And when I point out the glaring obvious political motivation behind their tirage, they brush me off. Who did you point this out to? Insisting it's all about the craft. It is as if they think we can't see the strings being pulled behind the game gate curtain. Oh no, uh, Dragon Age Railguard certainly does have some terrible writing, but that terrible writing is because of its political nature, nothing despite of it. The Dragon Age the Railguard, at every step of the way, comes across as soft, cuddly, and undangerous. You are witnessing the end of the world, supposedly. Elven gods are coming back to enslave and destroy everything. Yet nobody seems particularly perturbed. <laughs> Nobody seems particularly worried. Our characters are having tea in their brand new super secret hug box hideout that is so separate from the world that our characters are never even in danger in there. Your companions can't even take damage, much less die. And the entire dialogue is written around the idea of affirmation. Nothing can be thorny, nothing can be hostile. You are not even allowed to reject your companions. The only choice you have is to how great of a degree you worship them. You are worship, in interact with them, more correctly probably. And even then, if uh, just as yet another layer of affirmation, if you choose to not bang Harding, for example, then Harding will find somebody else to bang. Because we can't have a situation in which they might not have something happy, do, can we? No, no, no. We are at the end of the world and everyone's getting laid. It's ridiculous and it is because of the progressive politics inherent within it. What the boycotters ultimately see, boycotting doesn't work by the way, isn't a genuine debate over what is or isn't family friendly, nor are they concerned with actual moral degradation. Oh hell yes we are. Though they will always claim as much. No, the root of this resistance is the disruption of something sacred to them. A learning space defined not by question, but by answer, set down and immutable. They fear in truth that new stories, stories that reflect marginalized lives and speak back to the myths of the past will become something far more influential than the alternatives. Judging by the sales figures of Dustborn, by the sales figures of Concord, by the fact that EA and Bioware themselves declare loudly that there will be no further expansions or additional content to Dragon Age Origins, I don't think we really fear that anymore. <laughs> I think that was a fear we had four or five years ago, that there might actually be more wokists than us. I think we've disproven that quite significantly now. They fear that the stories might introduce something radical and unbound. That there, there are questions worth asking about history, identity, and values. That these questions might pull the next generation away from their inherited narratives. And that one is the final, like, piece de resistance. Newer generations are trending further right than ever before, practically. We are not seeing progressives anymore. We are not seeing a growth in progressive politics. We are seeing a rise of conservatism on virtually every level. In politics, in entertainment, in gaming, in movies, in televisions. Even the forefront fighters like Disney are now admitting to us that they are fighting tooth and nail to make sure that Inside Out 2, for the example, would not be about the gay. This is the thing. This is kind of harkening back to Ragnar Turnquist again. This is now an entire generation of progressives who have believed that they were the majority, that they were in the right, that they were universally morally good, that they had no reason whatsoever for introspection, and that their enemies were merely shadowy, dark figures out there that would certainly fade away once the sunlight shone in. But instead, they have revealed themselves to be a microscopic minority. A tiny, loudly shrieking group of people who only managed to claw their way into, well, 
the power that we see now into a premier premier position because of their allegations, because of them using our values against us by turning to a person and going, if you don't agree with me, you're a racist and you're no longer a gamer. They're no longer our audience, says game developer, the game reviewers. This is what caused Gamergate, not a, as we are now rather ridiculously seeing apparently, a hatred of Jewish people? Good God. And honestly, again, the bigger point here is simply that they have begun to realize that they are losing. And that now that they are going to start acting out again, they are beginning to rally the troops in response. We'll see how that works out for them. But uh, I would just like to end this on the old adage that a cornered rat will turn. And this one is looking pretty gosh darn stuck at this point. Very, very much so. The Democrats, and as a wider political movement, they are realizing that they can no longer utilize the old weapons and the fight is getting a bit more desperate. Let's see how aggressive they become or whether or not they will simply just stop being crazy. Wishful thinking, I know. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.